When we talk about sweating for the gods, it's primarily sweating for Zeus, who is the architect and supreme divinity of the Olympian order. And among his particular concerns are justice, for example, and the inviolability of making an oath. He's not especially well disposed towards human beings, it has to be said having made our lives full of hard labor and toil. The Greek word for this is ponos, which we shall return to uh, several times. Nonetheless, Zeus takes pleasure from examples of human excellence and from victory in competitive struggles, whether those are in battle or in athletics in artistic areas, or in the laws of good government of the Greek city, the polis. And in what follows, we're going to examine a few notable examples of sweating for the gods among the ancient Greeks. And I'd like to start here with a map. Um, I only have a couple of things to point out, but over on the left-hand side there you will see Olympia, which is the site of the equivalent of the Olympic Games for us today, what the Greeks called the Olympia Festival, held in honor of Zeus, king of the Olympian gods. Also, over on the far right, in the top right-hand corner, you'll see the city of Athens, which we shall refer to quite frequently. And then just down at the bottom here in the middle, is Athens' greatest rival uh, within Greek history, the city of Sparta. Now, uh, like everything else, Homer provides the template for the competitive spirit of the Greeks as we understand it today. And in Iliad 6, famously, we have the line, Ayen Aristuain Kai Huparakon Emini alone. Always to be the best and to be eminent beyond others. And this encapsulates the Greek competitive spirit. There is no better summation of what it means. It's important to be the most excellent and it's important to be better than all of your rivals. This is the very same instruction which Achilles received from his father, Peleus. On the vase painting here, what we actually see is, Achille is Odysseus and Ajax, two other warriors on the Greek side, fighting over the armor which belonged to the dead Achilles. And I mention that because we shall return to this later as well. Now, to give you a brief layout of where this talk is going to go. First of all, I'm going to introduce two very important figures. First of all, Eris, who is the goddess of strife, known in Latin as discordia, comes down to us as discord, and the term agon, which is the Greek word for competition. And if Eris is the cosmic force of conflict, the forces of strife at work in the universe at large, then Agon is the institution of organized conflict on the human level, to make a broad generalization. For the Greeks, the impact of Eris, of strife, on the city-state, the polis, 
is a matter of vital concern. And here we'll look at Sparta and Athens for evidence, focusing on athletic agones, athletic competitions, which were a primary means of redirecting destructive eris, whose most obvious form is war, into constructive eris in the form of regulated competition. After that, I'll move to a related form of agon, which Athens is largely responsible for. That's to say, drama. And my argument is that in both sporting and dramatic performances, what we actually have is two interconnected forms of organized struggle, which are played out, sweated, for the gods, as well as for the benefit of the city. Finally, we'll conclude with a few observations about notions of victory and how she, in turn, can be related back to strife. Now, here I would refer you, please, to the handout, which you should uh, have copies of. For those of you who do Greek, it'll be a valuable Greek lesson, uh, but translations are also provided. Now, when I was talking about Eris a few minutes ago, the observant among you will have noticed that I mentioned two kinds of strife. And this takes us to Hesiod, the second great poet after Homer in the Greek tradition. And Hesiod is the author of two very important works, the Theogony, which is the birth of the gods, and the works and days. Now, in the Theogony, we are operating basically on the level of the divine. And if you look at item number one in the handout, you will see there the description of how strife or eris came into the cosmos. Eris in this description is a single entity. There's only one kind of strife. And she is, in fact, a daughter of night. Now, many of these genealogical tables are designed to explain the characters of the figures who are created. So, of course, being a daughter of night, with all of its negative associations for the Greeks and other cultures, is not necessarily a positive sign. Eris is hostile to the Olympian order, which has been established by Zeus. And as you can see there, round about line 226, Hesiod tells us, loathsome strife bore painful toil and hunger and tearful pains, murders and slaughters, lies and tales and disputes, etc. And the reason why Hesiod probably makes this heiress, the daughter of night, is that he doesn't want to follow the more domesticated Homeric tradition and make her the daughter of Zeus and Hera. There, she's actually the sister of Ares, the war god. But that incorporates her, in a way, into the Olympian family, and that's not Hesiod's purpose here. Here we have a representation of night, uh, now, there aren't many of these in, uh, surviving from Greek art, but basically, knight is portrayed as a sort of dark charioteer, as you can see in this particular uh, picture. Up above, we have uh, Helios and Day. So these are the forces of daylight, which sort of wipe away the mist, which I think is the circular element uh, above the head of night here. Now, when we move to the works and days, which is Hesiod's other work, 
we move down to the human realm. The Works and Days, as the title may indicate, offers advice on such things as farming and how to make a living. In this poem, Hesiod is talking to his brother, Perseus. And it's interesting that, in fact, Hesiod's relationship with his own brother is marked by strife, by argument, because they had a dispute over their inheritance. And the implication is that the brother got a larger portion than he was entitled to by crooked means, by not following the justice of Zeus, which is straight, but by crooked uh, techniques of justice or argument, uh, which, as Hesiod says, belong to gift-eating kings. In other words, officials who take bribes. And here I would refer you to item number two on the handout, uh, beginning on the first page, and then we will move over to the second page. As you can see, the Works and Days opens with an invocation of Zeus. And there's a particular emphasis on how easily Zeus wields his power, how easily he can do things. And this is going to be contrasted very forcefully with the hard life of us human beings because we have ponos or toil as our lot. So what is the place of Eris? What is the place of strife in the Olympian order? Well, here in a couple of uh, representations, we can see her on the fringes of the Judgment of Paris. Now, those of you who've done mythology will probably know that the Judgment of Paris was ultimately responsible for the chain of events which brought about the Trojan War. And it's no surprise that Eris is on the fringes. Okay? She's the equivalent in later times and in much sort of reduced circumstances of the bad fairy in fairy tales who doesn't get invited to the wedding and then causes some trouble. And as the Theogony, Hesiod's first work, makes clear, Eris was running rampant across the universe before the consolidation of the power of Zeus. Here, for example, we see him fighting against the giants. And this was just one of the cosmic battles that he had to engage in in order to establish the Olympian government, the Olympian rule. And Zeus manages to stop Eris among the Olympians by developing the notion of an oath sworn on the waters of the Styx. So whenever Eris, or strife and quarrel, threatens to destabilize the Olympian order. Zeus brings the, the water, which then is used for swearing the oath on the sticks. And that's how Eris is sort of controlled in his new Olympian order. So much for the divine level, that's great. What about on the human level. Well, here, uh, if you would have a look at the rest of that uh, quotation from Hesiod on page two of the handout, you'll see that Hesiod elaborates his theory about strife. And right away, he says to his brother, there wasn't just one birth of strifes after all. But upon the earth, there are actually two. And the Greek particle ara there, the second word in the Greek, is very important because this sort of, this phrase, uk uh, ara, suggests that 
he's not exactly correcting something which went before, but he is at least elaborating on a previous argument. So what he's really saying to his brother is, and contrary to what you might think, Perses, there are in fact two types of strife, two erides on the earth. And it's very important that he says on the earth because that locates this narrative in the human realm. And if you look in the handout there too, you will see that Zeus places the good Eris as opposed to the bad one, whom we met in the Theogony, that he places the good Eris in the roots of the earth. So there appears to be a purpose behind Zeus's decision to give us the good heiress. The good heiress, as Hesiod then goes on to explain, promotes what we might call productive competition. All right, he says this strife is good for mortals. Potter is angry with Potter, in other words, is struggling with Potter, builder with builder, poet with poet. So this good heiress is what encourages the production of food with farming. It encourages the creation of wealth within the polis. He also points out that the good heiress is actually older, which gives her a kind of preeminence, although the arguments here are um, complicated and not always easy to follow. So this makes the two Eridae's sisters. And what Hesiod appears to be saying then is that Eris or strife can be both destructive and productive. And we might see some evidence for this kind of thing for instance, in the funeral games which are held in honor of Patroclus at the end of the Iliad. Funeral games, at least, are not war. They're not battle. But it has to be said also that it's the bad heiress which gets by far the most attention in the mythical tradition. And even in Hesiod, it seems that the bad heiress is always threatening to become more dominant. And so it may be better, in this case, following the arguments of Thalman and Jenny Strauss-Clay and others, to speak of these two forms of strife as twins. Not so much opposites, but twins. And we can also think of Eris operating along a kind of continuum. As Thalman says, the ambiguous uses of the word Eris show just how fragile the boundary is and how easily we can slip from the good Eris into bad Eris. Now, on to the polis. And here we have the city of Athens, which, when you look at it with its beautiful ruins, some might see as conclusive evidence for the benefits of the good heiress. We have the remains of their exquisite architecture and the theater and so on, as opposed to, for example, Sparta. Now, there are no real remains of ancient Sparta. There are a few miserable uh, archaeological sites which you can see here in the foreground but in the background all I have to show you really is a rather unimpressive uh, modern town. Uh, that's not to say of course that the non-ancient parts of Athens aren't pretty uninspiring as well. Now while detailed investigation of the differences between Athens and Sparta is not something we can go into today it is worth reminding ourselves of a few important details, not least because 
these two city-states clashed in the cataclysmic Peloponnesian War, which is perhaps the most notable example of bad heiress at work in the classical era. The Spartans, as some of you may know, subdued their local population in and around Messenia, creating a slave-like class of helots who required constant control. Athens and Sparta fought together, more or less cooperatively, against the invading Persians. Each state developed a very different response to the threat of stasis, uh, which is bad heiress in political terms. All right, class conflict, extreme political infighting. Athens moves in the direction of wider participation via democracy, and Sparta by adhering to a more conservative oligarchic form of government. In Sparta, the education system, the agoge, and the military training of the young Spartan males was extremely rigorous and had one aim, basically, which was military supremacy over the helots and all of their external enemies. So in Sparta, we have this rather unusual education system, which nonetheless found many supporters among the philosophers. Plato certainly flirts with um, some of the practices of Spartan education. Very intense eris among the young Spartan uh, citizens. But we also have a communal ideology, which is combined in various ways with traditional Greek competitiveness. And Sparta becomes a sort of imaginary ideal or a mirage, which has persisted for a very long time. Um, here is Degas' uh, famous painting of the young Spartans. Um, and, and the presence of the young Spartan females in the picture is important because Sparta, almost paradoxically, was one of the cities in ancient Greece, perhaps the only one, where young women were also educated and encouraged to take part in sporting activities. And of course, for us, this is the image that we associate with Sparta. This is what they are most famous for. When we think of Athens, however, we tend to think of things like philosophy and other elevated uh, disciplines within the arts and culture. Here is Raphael's School of Athens, which encapsulates this notion. Right? And indeed, Pericles, the famous Athenian general, and leading figure in Athenian democracy at the beginning of the Peloponnesian War actually claimed that Athens was a school for the rest of Greece. And here, uh, for those of you with philosophical interests, we have Plato and Aristotle. Um, the chronology, of course, doesn't work, but in Raphael's painting, they are uh, seen here discoursing Plato pointing upwards to his uh, heavenly forms or ideals, and Aristotle uh, waving his hand more in the direction of earthly matters and the ground. Now, the elements of Eris in the Greek philosophical tradition are quite obvious. Um, all Greek philosophers contend with their predecessors. It's very important to set out your philosophical wares in contradistinction to what your predecessors had said. Secondly, of course, there is the element of the dialogue, which we find elaborated to a very high level in Plato. Uh, although, interestingly, Plato does use the term eristic, derived from eris, to describe rather negatively uh, a group called the Sophists, who, he says, argue for the sake of argument, which is, he believes, a waste of energy. 
a non-productive form of eris. And while we're on this subject, I thought it would be useful to look at the resemblances between eris, strife, and eros, love or desire. And I just I put these two uh, pictures together here because it's quite intriguing. Uh, if you look at um, Eris on the right, there she is with her wings. And over on the left, we have Eros, also a winged figure. And I think it's worth pointing out here, for example, that the atomist philosopher Empedocles offered an explanation of the cosmos in terms of a struggle between two related concepts, Nikos and Philia. And these are basically versions of Eris and Eros. His atomic theory relies on the notion that everything is either pulled apart or brought together within the cosmos. We have a, a mythical analog to this, of course, in the liaison between Ares, the god of war, and Aphrodite, the goddess of love, in Homer. It's also worth remembering that Eros, the force of love or desire, is very frequently portrayed in lyric poetry and other texts as a figure of the same kind as Ares. So he's called a boxer, for example, an archer, a very violent, uh, aggressive figure, in spite of his associations with the uh, you know, delights of love and so on. Sappho, in fact, calls Eros a loosener of limbs, which recalls the battlefield terminology of Homer. And here is a, a couple of close-ups of Eros. Um, over on the right-hand side, he's depicted basically as a, a full-grown male, not a, not a sort of little child. And over on the left there, you see his association with movement, with swift movement. Uh, Eros, like Eris, comes upon us very quickly, hence the wings. And in connection with these two winged figures, I'd also like to draw your attention to the Erinies, who are also known as the Furies through Latin. And these are going to become relevant shortly um, when we uh, look at Orestes for a few minutes. So what I'm attempting to do here is to suggest some associations between Eris, strife, and other forces in the Greek cosmos and in human life in the hope of understanding the role of strife a little better. The Erinies are also said to be the daughters of night by Aeschylus and some Latin authors. They officiated at the birth of Horkos, the oath, which according to Hesiod brings most trouble for humans. And Horkos is born from Eris. Now, the Erinies are toned down and incorporated into the polis, most famously in Aeschylus's set of plays about Orestes. They there become the Eumenides, the kindly ones. So we have a sort of movement there from bad Eris again to good Eris through these figures of the Erinies into Eumenides. And this transformation, this toning down, takes us neatly from Eris to Agon, which is the other word at the start that I said I wanted to introduce. And for the Agon, once again, we need to consider uh, places like Olympia, where uh, the most significant athletic and other contests took place. Now, the word agon has an equal interesting history 
to the word eris. Uh, its original root lies in uh, 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 an element meaning to drive or to lead. It's also connected with the agora, which was the place of the assembly where uh, debates about policy and other matters would be held, also law cases in early times. It's further related to the word aethlos, which means contest, and aethlon, which means prize. And all of these words are bound up with the ideology of Greek sporting competition. And some of you may be familiar with these activities, especially if you're in the ancient sporting class, but there are very, very numerous remains from ancient sources depicting Greek athletes, both practicing and engaged in competition. It was, for them, perhaps the most important form of agonistic struggle in the period of the city-state. These are pentathletes, by the way. One uh, throwing a discus, the other preparing to perform the long jump with jumping weights. These are pancratiasts. The pancration, as its name might suggest, meaning all-powerful. It's a term given to Zeus very frequently. He's the pancratiast of the Olympians. Um, the pancration is sort of a mixture of wrestling and boxing with elements that you might see in mixed martial arts, for instance. It offered the chance for greater uh, violence against your opponent than, say, wrestling might have. These combat sports had very, very old uh, origins. All right, here on, a, on a, an old geometric vase where the skill in making human figures is very, very rudimentary, you can see an attempt to depict uh, two boxers. And when it comes to ancient sporting contests or other uh, organized agones, this was all uh, built around the notion of striving for victory, for Nike. And here she is. And on the left-hand side there, you'll see that she's carrying uh, a harp or a lyre. She presided over competitions in poetry and singing as well as competitions in athletic events. Nike is usually said to be the child of Ares, god of war, or sometimes to be born from Pallas and Styx, the very same river Styx where Zeus got the water for the oath to put a stop to Ares among the gods. And Nike always sits very close to Zeus. And at the Olympic site, for instance, the most important building was the Temple of Zeus, which is reconstructed here. And uh, there was a, a large statue of Zeus inside, but for our purposes, what's interesting is the statue of Nike on a pillar at the very front. It's a little easier to see here, uh, where the orientation is slightly different. Why is she on a pillar? Well, because it's something very lofty to aim for. It's something associated with the gods, who, among, in the case of the Olympians, dwell in the sky. She's winged because she's difficult to catch, like a bird, and because she threatens to fly away very, very easily. And this is the Nike of Samothrace, um, a very well-known sculpture from um, Greek times, uh, celebrated because of the skill of the sculptors in displaying the, um, the fabric in stone like this. And we will come back to her very briefly at the end. 
So when we talk about sweating for the gods, this is what Greek athletic competitors did. Because at the end of the contest, if you were victorious, then you received largely symbolic rewards. One of these was a wreath of leaves uh, from a tree sacred to the particular god. So in the case of the Olympia, uh, it's the olive tree, which is sacred to Zeus. And you can see he's depicted here on a coin wearing such a wreath. And over on the left-hand side, you see an athletic victor being decorated with ribbons. And these ribbons signify, well, these are the same things that were put onto sacrificial animals, which were going to be dedicated to the gods. So in this case, the athlete is presumably being dedicated to Zeus or whoever it happens to be in the same way. You'll also notice there on the left-hand side, uh, probably one of the judges, the so-called Helanodikai. And their role at the festivals was to stand in for the god to make sure that uh, nobody cheated. In other words, that the straight judgments of Zeus are followed, not the crooked ones, which Hesiod uh, condemns. This is another uh, representation of an athletic victor who here is engaged in making a sacrifice of some sort to the divinity. And in terms of Nike, or victory, it's worth remembering that among the Greeks, the winner takes it all. There were no prizes for second place, or third, or anything like that. In fact, Pindar, who writes victory odes for athletic winners, depicts the lot of the losers very darkly. They go home by uh, unknown paths. No welcome awaits them in their city. Even their parents are ashamed of them. And it wasn't just a matter of winning in the particular festival, there was a kind of super agon, a sort of super category of the, the circle, the four main festivals. If you were able to win, say, in boxing in all four, then you achieved a sort of grand slam victory. In Athens, at the Panathenaic festival, you would receive uh, vases with olive oil. And here we have a prize amphora, presumably given to a pancratiast, since that's what's depicted on one side. And on the other, you see the goddess Athena, for whom the athletes sweated in Athens. Athens, however, does something slightly different with the tradition of the agor. Possibly because they started very early in reforming their political system to move towards democracy and greater participation, breaking down the authority of the old aristocratic elite. Democratic Athens promotes an additional kind of agon, which we might call cooperative competition. And we see signs of this in the fact that uniquely at the Panathenaic festival, there were events for teams of people, for groups, sometimes drawn from particular tribes within the city. We also know that there were prizes here for second and third and sometimes fourth and fifth place. And that prizes were not just symbolic, sometimes they had actual monetary value. And this marks 
a very definite departure from the mainstream of the Greek athletic agon. Also, in Athens, we find torch races. Now, this is often of great interest to people who think about the torch at the modern Olympics, but that has absolutely nothing to do with the Greek practice. What's of interest here is the fact that torch races were, were run very often in honor of Prometheus. And in Hesiod's narrative, Prometheus is the only one of the gods who really cares about human beings and who gave us fire so that our life would be less hard than Zeus had originally intended it to be. And torch races appear to have been relays, where, obviously, it's not just the individual striving for victory, but a team working in relays. And this is highly unusual in the Greek tradition. We still end in the same way. Here is the winner of the torch race, perhaps the leader of the winning team or the last runner who gets to the, the finishing post, once again making some kind of dedication to the gods and being uh, greeted there by Nike, by victory on the left-hand side. And this innovation in terms of uh, sporting contests does have another interesting side to it uh, in terms of what Athens does to the agar. Because in Athens, we have a very interesting link between the agon in the stadium and the agon on the stage. And it's not really an exaggeration to say it, that it was the Athenians who invented theater and drama. Other cities copied it later, but it emerged from Athens, not from Sparta or anywhere like that. And to summarize, the agon in Athens, in terms of the theater, it operates on multiple levels. So we are still sweating for the gods, in this case, in honor of Dionysus, who was the god presiding over musical and theatrical competitions. Um, poets like Euripides and Aeschylus and Sophocles were participating in a competition with their peers for victory. So that we have an agon of the poets themselves. The plays are often, at least implicitly, presided over by what we might call gods of the agon. The ultimate guarantors of justice are usually figures like Zeus or Athena. And then, if you think about Greek tragedies or comedies themselves, the drama itself is structured on the agon. Right? You have characters who are diametrically opposed to each other. All right? So, for example, Prometheus against Zeus in the Prometheus Bound. Or Orestes against the Erinyes, the Furies, in Aeschylus' trilogy. We have a central agon in many cases in the form of a, a lively debate. This happens particularly in comedy for instance, and we also have sort of rapid-fire uh, exchanges. And these rapid-fire exchanges, one line or two lines back and forth between two characters, like Jason and Medea, for instance, or Orestes and his accusers, these seem to me to be very similar to the exchange of blows in combat sports. And the language which is used would tend to support this. All right, we even have a, a, a vase with two boxes in the Texas Tech Museum, which I thought it was my duty to publicize. So if you want to see the actual thing on campus, you can nip over to the museum, and there is a very nice vase with Greek boxers exchanging blows. Finally, 
And here I would refer you to uh, the last two pages of the handout, which we're going to zip through very quickly. Um, the language of the plays itself, the use of metaphor. And I suggest here that you think of the opening of a Greek drama, the opening of a play, as akin to the opening of a wrestling match, which had its sort of opening stance, as you can see here on the screen. Wrestling is actually the most common source for metaphors, uh, for obvious reasons, I suppose, since that was the most popular and oldest uh, sport in the Greek polis. And um, if you look at item number four on the handout there, you'll see that in a poem from Pindar, we have many uh, athletic metaphors and images woven together. Pindar is our author of Victory Odes. And notice here the way he talks about twisting the strife, grasping words, being thrown in the wrenchings of speech. Also, there is here an allusion to bad Eris with the mention of spiteful people. Pindar also is very quarrelsome with regard to his own poetic critics. And that's what he's alluding to here. Now, moving on to um, other items in the handout. Number five, for example, where you have Aeschylus struggling with Euripides in debate, we read that the two poets come to strife, ice erin, debating in wrestlings. Number six, for example, from Sophocles, but I ask that the gods never abolish the wrestling which is good for the city. They're not talking about literal wrestling here. This is the wrestling of debate, of political argument, of the struggle to decide policy. Number seven, three quotations from the Prometheus Bound. Right? That play is an extended agone between Zeus and Prometheus, likened to a wrestling match. Prometheus, as you may know, is immobilized. He's nailed to a rock, which is very much like being in some kind of wrestling hold. And it's spoken of in similar fashions. But even though Prometheus is nailed to the rock, he knows that Zeus, who may be all-powerful, who may be Pan Krates at the moment will meet his downfall, that he will be thrown, like a wrestler is thrown, if he proceeds with his plan to marry Thetis. This is the secret that Prometheus knows and which Zeus must somehow extract from him. And much is made in the language of drama of throwing your opponent, of falling to the ground. So if you look on the last page of the handout, page four, some quotations there from Aeschylus's trilogy about Orestes. In the first one up there, uh, Zeus sends Agamemnon against the city of Troy so that he can bring many wrestlings to the enemy. Many wrestlings that weigh down the limbs with the knee pressed into the dust. In quotation B there, this imagery is given a kind of grotesque parodic twist when Clytemnestra, who is Agamemnon's wife, describes how she murdered her husband, striking him with three deadly blows. Apparently in Greek wrestling you had to 
throw your opponent three times in order to win. And she says, I strike him twice, and when he had fallen, I gave him a third blow. Uh, item number C there, 8C. Um, in the third play of the trilogy, which is the Humanities, who are our rehabilitated Erinies, they put Orestes in tr on trial for the revenge killing of his mother with Athena as judge. All right. And at one point he admits, yes, I did kill my mother. And the Furies jump on that and say, aha, this is already one of the three falls. Three falls that we need to win. Orestes says, yes, you can boast that, but I'm not down and out yet. At the end of the play, Orestes is acquitted, and that's when the Arrhenius are rehabilitated, and we move from good Eris, I'm mean, sorry, we move from bad Eris into good Eris. And in the very last quotation there, 8E, you'll see that Athena celebrates the Eris in doing good, the rivalry in doing good within the city. And here she is on the Panath Panathenaic Amphora. So, to conclude, I return you to Zeus. Remember, it is in, it's in his honor and by his sanction that all this sweating has been done. And I'd like to conclude with just a couple of observations about our winged friends, Eris and Nike, strife and victory. You remember how Hesiod presented his two forms of Eris and yet suggested that one of one may very easily shade over into the other. And I think we can say something similar about Eris and Nike. Might we not also think of them, perhaps, as twins, as complementary, with a tendency for one very suddenly to change over into the other. It's not always easy to tell them apart after all. And there's an oil flask in the British Museum, which I have up on the screen for you here, which depicts warriors going off, presumably, into battle. And then on the other side, there is this figure. And scholars disagree as to whether this is Eris or Nike, and there's no secure way of interpreting the figures. She clearly has two pairs of wings, perhaps a second pair, it's unclear, but that could just be her clothing. Um, we cannot ultimately decide. More speculatively, perhaps, um, if you look at this image of the creation of Pandora on the left, Pandora, who's closely connected with Eris in Hesiod, and also a source upon us of toil for humans, for men. Um, we have up there in the top part of the vase what is presumably Eros, sun certain, bringing uh, her decorative items, decorative clothes. She's a necklace and other things uh, in Hesiod's account. Over on the right, we have Nike bringing ribbons with which the victorious athlete will be decorated. So we should then, I think, remembering what Pindar has to say about the fleeting nature of victory, and even more his constant statements that the victor has to behave with wisdom and restraint and modesty, we should note that victory is a highly unstable state, and that it does not, in fact, mark in any significant way the end of the struggle. It may conclude the agon, the 
organized competition, but it does not put an end to eris, to strife. And here, we go back again to the bars that I showed you right at the very beginning. This is Ajax and Odysseus fighting over the arms of Achilles. And this symbolizes the continuation of Eris, even after the battle in which Achilles was killed, and ultimately <coughs> after the Trojan War. Right? Things didn't get any easier for the Greek heroes when the war was over. I just think of the difficult returns home. And we can think also about Book 24 of the Odyssey, which a lot of scholars would like to say is spurious, wasn't really written by her. But in Book 24 of the Odyssey, after the suitors have been killed and Odysseus has regained his palace, he and his son Telemachus are then drawn into battle to fight against the relatives of the suitors. And it's only when Athena steps in and puts a stop to the fighting that it comes to an end. But it's very clear from the structure of the Homeric narrative that this is seen as temporary. And that seems to suggest, once again, that Eris is a continuing uh, force in the cosmos. So, going back to the Nike of Samothrace, here she is, famously, notoriously, without the head and the face. But I think that's a good reminder for us that the cycle, Eris, Nike, Eris, Nike, Eris, is a continuing and inevitable one. That cycle is, in one sense, then, our human ponds, our human hard labor.